Everyone out there, you all set? All ready to begin? Anybody you uh, remember Woody Guthrie? He wrote this uh, back in the 30s. It sounds like he wrote it last year. Why don't you join in with us as much as you want? in a story that begins long before America ever was. It's a story about how we're to interact with empires and kings. It's a story of how we're to interact with presidents and powers. And it's a story about a God who loves humanity so much that we're given the freedom to mess up a good world. And it's a story of a God that loves us so much that God can't stand to watch us destroy ourselves. So God interrupts history over and over to save us from ourselves. And our story begins in a garden before there were any kings or presidents, and only God was king. God takes the soil from the earth and breathes life into it to create man and woman, and everything is good. But there's only one tree that they are not to eat from. It's the tree holding the knowledge of good and evil. And flowing from this knowledge comes violence and murder, the inaugural acts of life outside of the garden. And so the quest to be like God continues as people impressed by their limitless power try to build towers to reach towards the heavens. They want to make a name for themselves. But that type of grand building collaboration wouldn't be God's solution to a world full of violence. You know, it's not that they were a threat to God, but they were a threat to themselves. And so God scatters the centralization of power at Babel and spreads them out with many languages. Instead of improving the world through a vast unification project, it indeed seems that there is another way. <laughs> 
And God's other way is fantastic. God chooses a barren, elderly old couple named Abraham and Sarah. They're like the antithesis of the Babel project. They're small, powerless, and weak. And maybe it's just because they were at the point of extinction that God chooses them. But they sure weren't sitting around. I mean, they're 100 years old, and they're not playing bingo and shuffleboard. I mean, they're some sassy seniors, you know. <laughs> they're ready to leave everything familiar and go on an adventure with God and bless the world and that barren old woman Sarah becomes the mother of a nation and it's not just their story it's our story it's a story filled with struggle and suffering and pain for the people God calls are people suffering deeply from the ugliness of the empire in which they lived they were making bricks for the storehouses of Pharaoh while they could barely feed their own families they were slaves but God rescued them Sixteen tongues, and what do you get? But not a day older and deeper in that same period. Don't you call me? Cause I can go out my soul to the company store. You know the sixteen tongues, and what do you get? But not a day older. And as Pharaoh rescues them, uh, as God rescues them from Pharaoh's empire, who will God raise up to lead them? Well, none other than a little baby whose very birth was a subversive act of civil disobedience. He's born in the middle of an imperially sanctioned genocide, and his courageous mother puts him in a little basket and floats him down the river where he's found by another brave mama who takes him in. That little baby will become Moses, the one who will say to Pharaoh, let my people go. <laughs> that was rough, y'all. <laughs> oh, the one who will say, let my, my people, people go. go. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and lead them on to the promised land beyond Pharaoh's slavery and genocides and empire. And on their way out of Egypt, God protects them and says, you need not fight. You need only be still, for I will fight for you. It's a lesson that Jewish writers and rabbis will need to recall over and over again as they make their way in the world as freed slaves. So when they're pursued by Pharaoh's armies, God swallows up their chariots. Nothing short of the redemption of the whole human family. 
new laws are put into place to be the foundations of this nation that is set apart from the other nations. They are given things like gleaning and jubilee to make sure that the poor are cared for and that inequality is dismantled. And some of the laws that they had may seem a little strange to us, like you can't eat shellfish. That would be hard for some of us. And that you can't touch the skin of a pig. What would we do during football season, you know? As long as you wear gloves, I guess you're okay. But, you know, like these laws like circumcision and how you're to cut your hair, some of them may not have the spiritual significance today that they had back then, but they were all ways that they were being formed and and literally branded on their bodies and as a community, as a set-apart people for God. Some of those laws were things like how we're to deal with evil, like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, maybe one of the most obscure but in forgotten and distorted laws a, a lot of times we see it as a license for revenge but it was rather a limitation of violence to say if someone knocks out your eye you can't poke out both of their eyes if someone breaks your arm you can't break their arm in their leg an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth no more if someone kills three thousand of your people you can't kill a hundred thousand of theirs Oh, boy. Uh, You know, it's it's as if to say, if you don't do these things, you're going to end up like Egypt. You're meant to be different. For in them, God was forming a new culture, a culture that is counter-imperial. It may have only taken a few days to get out of Egypt, but it will take lifetimes to get Egypt out of them. Pharaoh still colonized their imaginations. It was hard to think of life outside of Egypt. They longed for the food and the comfort Ironically, that was back in Egypt. Slavery, ironically, seemed more stable than God's exodus. They wanted to be like the other nations around them and have a king and build a temple. But they're scolded and reminded that God likes camping out with them in the desert. But with the predatorial nations all around them, they get scared. And they push away from having their judges to wanting to have a monarchy. After all, kings have militaries and they fight wars, they assure us. But God assures them that God is their king, but they persist, and God warns them what kings do. Here are the, first, the words of 1 Samuel 8. This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. And the prophet Hosea says that in God's anger, God gave them a king. The prophets will continue to remind the people as the things kings do, that this is exactly what they asked for when they demanded their king. The kings are only doing what God told them that kings do, and this is what they wanted. But in the move toward a king, we can again see God's humor, God's upside-down way of redemption. A little shepherd boy is chosen to be their king. At one point, he fights a giant with a slingshot. It's clear that God has a very peculiar way of looking at power and strength. It's like when an entire city wall in Jericho is toppled without a single weapon being raised, but only with celebration and music. Or it's like when Gideon rallied an army of over 30,000 and God insisted that they whittle it down over and over again until it was just a little puny army of 300. That's how God works, audacious upside-down power. God's people need not trust in their own strength, in their own warriors, in their own chariots, but in God's providence. Ironically, this is the intended message carried in the old stories of war and God's protection. 
So there are the stories of kings, kings, and more kings, and in their tracks are adultery, murder, theft, debauchery, but God never gives up on the people. And while we hear stories in history through the eyes of kings and presidents, God tells stories through the mouths of the prophets. The prophets are sort of the thorn in the flesh of kings. They can make and unmake kings. They are the mouthpieces of God. God's love and rage they, they just flows out of the mouths of the prophets. Hear the words of Rabbi Abraham Heschel. To us, what is a single act of injustice, cheating in business or exploitation of the poor, what is slight to the prophets was an absolute disaster. To us, an injustice is an injury to the welfare of the people, but to the prophets, it was a death blow to existence. To us, what is an episode to the prophets is an absolute catastrophe, a threat to the world. After all, a lot's at stake, and sometimes it just takes one little voice to interrupt the patterns of injustice. And that's why the prophets are always doing weird things, right? Like turning rods into snakes and smacking rocks till fire comes out. Uh, Jeremiah wore a yoke on his back to symbolize captivity until he gets thrown in jail. And uh, uh, John the Baptist ate locusts and wore camel skin. It kind of looked like Jay back there, you know, and uh, yet, like, he did that until he got his head cut off. You know, sometimes folks don't like the prophets, and yet they do embarrassing things like Ezekiel. He pulls a protest in the nude off, you know, and cooks with poop. And yet, like, as we read, it's a little embarrassing, but it's not nearly as embarrassing as the things that we do, which they wish to expose. For they give us an alternative vision of what the future could look like, one where the lion and the lamb lay down together, where the people beat their swords into plowshares, a future that looks beautiful, and yet we continue to choose our kings in our own ways, and so our groaning continues. As Israel really wanted this king, God then reveals to them the most audacious kind of king. In an act of divine conspiracy, Jesus springs from the rubble of Israel's experiments with power to show us what kind of king God is. Even the idea of a kingdom will be subverted and turned upside down. This king will unveil and show as a farce all patterns of domination and coercion. In doing so, he will redeem the true power of God. An upside down power operating according to a most unlikely policy. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. His mother, Mary, infused with the true king of the Jews in her womb, sang a song of how God brings down the lofty pretentiousness of the powers. <laughs> 